40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic, plus amazing people like Steve Jobs, Einstein, Henry Ford, who invented the mass-produced motor car, are dyslexic. So let's start on a positive note on how are dyslexic's brains different? So dyslexic people have a slightly different wiring of our brains. Um, and it means that we're very good at, like really, really good at certain things, but also we struggle and often struggle quite badly with other things. So it's a bit like having a spiky profile. If you think of intelligence as being sort of all along an, an average line and you're either all above average intelligence or below average intelligence, a dyslexic person will be right at the top percentile in some things and right at the bottom in others. So in education, that creates a real problem because most of the things that we test dyslexics on or test everybody on actually are the things that we struggle with. So um, it really is a spiky profile being brilliant at some things and not very good at others. And the good news is all the things that we're not good at, technology can now do. So really, we just need to look at all the things we're good at. And that's how we need to be measured. And I find this really interesting because, I mean, I definitely found that out. I was, wasn't found... I don't like to say like diagnosed, because I think that's a really stigmatized word, but I didn't figure out that I was blessed with dyslexia until I was in my mid twenties. So for me, it was a totally different narrative on understanding intelligence. And, you know, I basically felt that for most of my life, I was stupid or, or non-intelligent on that scale that you recognized. But for people that are maybe dyslexic, have partners that are dyslexic, have children that are dyslexic, co-workers that are dyslexic, if our brains are wired a bit differently, what are some of the benefits that can come out of this? If you imagine dyslexic people um, have brilliant creativity, they're brilliant innovators, they're brilliant at thinking differently. Um, so we, we like to not stick to the rules. We like to challenge things. And that's what pushes the world forward. That's one of the really big strengths. A lot of uh, the greatest inventions that we have, like Thomas Edison was dyslexic, the light bulb and all the other things that he created. Steve Jobs, who came up with the idea of a pocket computer and then developed the iPhone, which has just transformed everybody's lives. Um, Richard Branson and Virgin. Richard famously likes to disrupt industries. If he sees something that he thinks could be done better, then he'll start a company to do it better, whether that's Virgin Media, Virgin Mobile or Virgin Hotels. So it is about that really wanting to, to break the mold and do things better and imagining what could be, not just believing what is. So it's that sort of visionary piece. Also, dyslexic people are really, really high on emotional intelligence. So they understand themselves and the impact that they can have, but they also understand other people and are very, really, really good at building teams, which is vital for any entrepreneur, well, for anybody really, but it's vital for any entrepreneur, which is why you often see so many successful dyslexics are uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and I think the other thing is that we're very good at seeing the big picture. So it's almost like, I know when I, that's one of my dyslexic thinking skills. I very much kind of take a helicopter view of things and look across lots of different things and then simplify into what's the real nub of what we're trying to communicate here or what we're trying to do here. And again, that, that's useful across every single organization, business or whatever you do. And then there's connecting the dots and reasoning and having um, a, a real sort of sense of questioning and, and looking at um, how things might fit together that other people don't see are connected. And that's one of the things that GCHQ, um, the British Intelligence Agency that we work with, really values. And a huge percentage of spies at GCHQ are dyslexic and they actively look for dyslexic thinkers. There are 40% of their apprenticeship scheme uh, are dyslexic. So it's, that's a massive over-representation um, because they love the way that dyslexics think and value it's important. I find that fascinating because it's actually really encouraging for anyone who may have dyslexia or for anyone that has a child that has dyslexia to actually know this is not a hindrance. This is actually can be an advantage. And knowing that, you know, people like the UK Intelligence Agency are hiring dyslexic minds for their specific skills, which, by the way, I know that you celebrated your fifth birthday at Made by Dyslexia by adding in the dyslexic skill on LinkedIn, which I immediately added and felt quite proud because it kind of reduced that stigma to kind of shine that light quite proudly on that. How can other organizations look at bringing this more in as something that is a real positive spin 
as opposed to something which I have always kind of grown up feeling very heavily stigmatized against and maybe too ashamed to mention that I'm dyslexic in most of my life because I thought, well, I'd probably be looked at quite differently and maybe not chosen. I think the stigma is is real and it's um, very much, you know, when I talk about simplifying things, if if we understand the problem of dyslexia and the advantage of dyslexia and where we should be going, simplifying how we change things is is very easy. We have to change the way people understand it and perceive it because it is not a disability and difficulty. It's a really brilliant way of thinking. But then we also have to make sure that we educate every workplace and every school because kids who are dyslexic do need help early on to learn to read and the things that they struggle with. And once they have that, they can fly. And in the workplace as well, we're, like you say, measuring with the wrong tools. So we have to look at what do we need to do in the workplace to not put everything, everybody through the sort of sausage factory of funnel of measuring but actually think what skills do we need for this job and then look for those skills that's what GCHQ do they actually look for and and there are lots of other companies now that are actively um, doing this you look for the skills that you want for the job not using filtering systems with psychometric tests where dyslexics often slip up. Mm, I mean literally mentioning the word test to me gives me hives that is something that is still heavily pronounced as of how intelligent we are it's a real measure but something that I really believe in, and before we kind of get on to like the disadvantages and you know the shame that shrouds dyslexia or people that have you know grown up with that I still want to focus on the positives because something that I see that I've grained myself and this maybe this is a positive, but it kind of came through adversity, is my resilience and problem-solving skills. And I think that's because throughout school, I felt that I needed to survive in that environment. And I also needed to fit in because you don't want to stick out like a sore thumb that you don't understand something. And that was really interesting because I basically had to teach myself how I would bend my mind to fit into this education system or how I even like to describe it as this higher intelligent stereotype. But reality actually made me quite a good problem solver. It's a really interesting conversation, isn't it? It's the sort of nature nurture. Um, and I think it's a bit of both. I mean, my I am really resilient. I'm very determined. I never take no for an answer. In fact, if somebody tells me something's not possible, then I have to make it possible. And that is that's not born out of... Um, difficulty. That's just in my nature. And I think that's my dyslexic thinking. And I had quite a unique education in that my, the first part of my education was terrible. And I was at a terrible school that didn't understand dyslexia. And then age sort of eight, nine, I went to a brilliant school that did understand dyslexia. So arguably, I haven't had the same struggle as people like you went through the whole of school really not understanding. So I, I genuinely believe that just the resilience, the, um, the strive to do things comes from dyslexic thinking. I think it's a trait that we have. Um, but also it can be, you know, if you, if you're failing, you have to find different ways of doing it. So it's that I don't think we'll ever agree. Anybody ever will agree on the nature nurture argument, but it's, I think we're all a little bit different, but it's com- probably a combination of the two. Well, it was interesting because I've only started looking at this recently. Um, you know, I, I think when I was figured out when I was 23 that I was dyslexic when I went back to university and, it was the first time ever a professor had said to me, actually, I, you're not stupid. I don't think you should drop out. I'm going to send you for a dyslexia test. And then obviously my fascination with this group, because I started to figure out how my mind worked, which was the first time anyone had ever explained that to me. Um, and it was like a eureka moment, but it also was the first time that I felt heavily seen. And before then, you know, I was modeling and I think that really saves me, funny enough, because actually for the first time, you know, I did quite well in something. And it was the first time since school that I was actually kind of acknowledged. And it's not until I went back to school that all of my fears came back again. And now I look at this and everyone says, well, you must be so resilient from the modeling industry because you're turned away every single day. And I'm actually like, I don't think it was the modeling industry that made me resilient. I think it was genuinely facing this adversity every day of not feeling that I was fitting in or feeling completely um, separated from my peers. When I think about having this conversation, I still feel very emotional about it. I still feel very emotional about the stigma that's attached to that. And I would love to like kind of like bring this to light because 
I now feel in a more of a balanced state of mind talking about dyslexia because I've understood it. I've understood actually how I have held myself back, maybe in my 20s. But now I've kind of come to the understanding of it. It's actually given me way more confidence. And so I think anyone that maybe is on that journey or has a child on that journey or a partner on that journey or see somebody at work who maybe is underconfident because of this, you know, how can we kind of start banishing that shame? Because I think it's something that is just not understood. I'm going to let you in on a natural remedy that I use to calm the mayhem of modern life. And it's really helped improve my sleep quality. It's the functional mushrooms Bloomin have created, which I use daily. And I'm so confident from how well they've worked for me. Bloomin are giving away a thousand free samples if you use the code LWBW1000 at checkout. In a recent randomized, double-blind and placebo-controlled study, patients with neurosthenia, a condition characterized by fatigue, headaches and irritability, were treated with reishi mushrooms. After eight weeks, they all recorded significantly lower scores for fatigue and an improved sense of well-being. And before you think shrooms, no, they don't get you high and they don't taste anything like mushroom. And for you to try for yourself, Bloomin are giving away a thousand free samples of the mushroom powder when you use the code LWBW1000 at checkout. Just head to bloomin.co.uk and get your first Bloomin product completely free. There's also links in the show notes. A hundred percent agree with you. Um, and that's one of the, the big missions we have. Our big goal at Made by Dyslexia is to remove that stigma. Um, and I think the, the step of LinkedIn adding it as a skill was a massive step. And the thousands and thousands of, of messages that I've had personally or the charity has had from people saying, thank goodness, suddenly somebody understands how I think. And it's just that relief that you can lean into all the things you're really good at. And, and I think also if you, if you bear in mind, we're at school for God knows how many years and the whole time we're at school from when you start age five, you can't do the things the other kids can do. So your spelling test, struggling to learn to read, all of those things don't come as naturally to dyslexics as they do to somebody who isn't dyslexic. So from a very, very early age, you're creating a negative self-concept. And there's that, there's the, the um, research, isn't there, that for every negative comment, you need for positive comments to to overcome that. So if you think it's constantly at school, you can't do your times tables, you can't do this, you looking around the other room, feeling embarrassed. You know, we all remember what it's like when there's a sort of round robin reading and you're just waiting for your turn, think mm-hmm. trying to read ahead so you know what it says. All of those things run so deep. And I think that's why dyslexic people so feel so passionate and so relieved when suddenly people are, are looking at their strengths. So I think it's going to take a long time to to get rid of the stigma. But I do know, you know, we, we did a TV interview yesterday on Good Morning Britain with Richard Branson, and it was all about strengths because that's what Richard and I believe about and are working together so passionately to change. And just the flood of, well, presenters, the people at Good Morning Britain who all came over wanting advice for their kids because they had dyslexic kids. And then all the emails that come through afterwards with parents saying, thank you, now I can really focus on the things my child is good at. We just, as a as a group, as a movement, you know, the charity is called Made by Dyslexia. We're all dyslexic and we have got this big movement of dyslexic people. We have to show the world how brilliant our thinking is. And we have to stick a finger up at the world to say, you know what, all those things you're testing in schools and all those psychometric tests you're putting us through don't matter because AI can do that now. You need to lean into to our strengths. So hopefully with the free training we've got for schools and the workplace as well, we're really going to be able to to move that dial further forward than we already have. So I'm excited about the future. I'm excited. I think there's this movement coming that just needs to really show the world that we're brilliant. We've got so much to offer and don't call us thick. No, honestly, please just don't label anyone as thick. I think that is something that was so detrimental to me. And I still get terrified, you know, launching a podcast. Sometimes I'm 
reciting very scientific words, I'm thinking, gosh, if I say something, I'm going to get absolutely hounded. But it's just sometimes how I'm reading and how I'm interpreting my, and my brain speed. And I think it's really important to actually not judge people on that. I remember when I was doing my TED talk, actually, and that was a really big moment for me because I remember, Christ, I'm going to have to stand on stage tell us very kind of like, you know, structured story. Structure is not part of my um, <laughs> <laughs> my characteristic at all. And I was really inspired by Ken Robinson. And I know that you kind of cite him as well. Um, and it's how do schools kill creativity? And I just really wanted a chance to talk to you about this because you mentioned it in yours, but it's something that I watched over and over again. And I remember crying the first time I watched that and I actually sent it to my parents because he really explained something very, quite beautiful. And it's not just about dyslexics. And I think this is something that I really want to get across in this podcast. 97% of kids go to school, at their elementary school, their primary school as lateral thinkers. And that's kind of creative thinkers. But by the time they leave that primary school, it's down to 43%. And that's all of kids. And so that basically is showing what you're just discussing on how we're really keeping this kind of prescriptive, linear thinking. Um, and we're told that's correct. Now, if you're not dyslexic, you kind of work for that. I mean, you'll lose that lateral thinking, but it works for you. But if you're dyslexic, you really struggle. So how is the education system failing? And like, how, what, what are you doing at the moment? Because I know you're doing so much and I'd just love to kind of dive into this to kind of like tr change that belief, but also change the system of how we are teaching our kids at school. I think there's two things we need to do. Firstly, we have got a system all around the world that is measuring the wrong things and does need to change. But we also have dyslexic children in every single school system around the world. So the first thing we need to do is level the playing field. So help teachers to understand that these kids, bright kids, there's one in five kids in every classroom that think differently and need some help to fit into a system that basically is not shaped for them. And that's something we're doing with free teacher training. It's video based. It's brilliant for parents as well. So um, that's about educating and trying to, to get people to understand that tests and things are not going to, they're, they're not fit for purpose for anybody, arguably, but certainly not dyslexics. And then we do need to change the system. And I actually think that artificial intelligence is going to be a massive, massive um, wake up call for educators because artificial intelligence was asked to take the LSATs and the SATs exams, all of the high stakes exams that you take in the US to get into colleges and it aces every single one. So arguably, we're now testing young people and measuring them and their, their life chances of going to the college, college of their choice is being measured by tests that artificial intelligence can do. What needs to happen is we need to stop measuring children with these standardized tests because the world doesn't need standardized minds. It needs minds that think differently. So the whole way we view intelligence and the whole way that we test intelligence needs to change. And it's easier to change that in the workplace because if you have a job to fill, you know what talents you need to fill that job. So if we look at talent-based hiring, that's quite easy to do. And then we need to look at how we transform that into education. So I think that we're working very closely with businesses like EY and Microsoft and other Randstad and other huge organizations to look at the, the school to work pipeline. Cause at the moment that what's coming out of school and, and that the skills that we're measuring are not the skills that the workplace are looking for. So I'm hopeful change will come and will come soon. Cause Ken Robinson was talking about that. How many years ago? But you know, there's a really, really sad story about that. When Ken Robinson, when Tony Blair's government came into power, Ken Robinson was brought in as an advisor to the Labour government and he was asked to consult on all the things that needed to happen to help create these amazing, innovative, creative minds. And he came up with all sorts of advice and guidelines, which basically almost everything got shelved. So, you know, I think he was before his time. I think the time for change is now. So let's hope in the UK when we get a new government, which we will, I probably will soon, or even if we get the same one back in again, who knows, but let's hope that they'll look at the future and really see we can't still keep educating kids with a completely antiquated system. 
But I think power is for teachers as well. Teachers don't like the testing system. And I think there's change is coming. There's definitely change coming. Well, I hope so. And I think, you know, when you just mentioned about the creativity and entrepreneurs, I think this also applies to anybody who is neurodivergent, right? It's people that have ADHD and are told they're super naughty at school and they're disruptive. So they actually just kind of give up learning. Or autism. There's so many different traits of how we are heavily stigmatized if we suffer with neurodivergency. And if kids do end up kind of getting through the schooling system and sadly like a lot of them don't but the ones that do can go on to do incredible things and that's when people flourish and I think just hearing that on what you're saying you know it's like when people escape the schooling system that's when they feel that they can kind of spread their wings and and figure out who they are and I know that this is something that's so as much as to me is to you when we spoke earlier about the passion you have for this, you know, I can see the passion. And you know, you, you're basically your mission is by 2030 is to not exist made by dyslexia, because you and I've had made this such a big impact in the world, and put in these systems that you don't need to exist, because your message is so clear and so loud, that actually, it's not useful anymore, because we all know about it. And I think that is so inspirational to hear. But I can feel that comes from like, a deep passion of you having to fight this kind of in the early years of having dyslexia. So I'd love for you to kind of tell me and our listeners your story, because I think these moments of when people figure out they're dyslexic and they're heard and they're seen, is quite pivotal for every dyslexic. I have a favour to ask. 74% of people that watch this podcast haven't hit subscribe and 15% haven't hit the bell to turn on notifications. I want this podcast to reach as many people as possible to keep sharing expert information and powerful stories to improve your life. So if you've ever enjoyed my podcast, please hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. Doing this small favor will really help me. Thank you. Yeah, I think it definitely is. And it's definitely what what drives me. So I I started at a very um, strict traditional girls' school, um, and it was it was a private school, and it was one of the schools that fed all of the top girls' schools, secondary schools. Um, and I was an unmitigated disaster at school. I'm not a particularly shy person. I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert, but I'm not particularly shy. But school made me feel like I just wanted to sit at the back of the class and not talk to anybody and avoid everything because I couldn't do what the other kids could do. So I, I, I really struggled. I struggled with maths was my biggest, biggest failing. But it was a constant. I mean, I, I was mad about animals and my science teacher was also my maths teacher and basically told me that I should f- give up or, you know, forget any idea of wanting to be a vet because I wasn't clever enough. So it was like every day I would go in there and it would be a negative. And eventually my mum and dad got called into the, um, into the school's office and I was told that, or they were told that I wasn't going to pass any exams. So basically I needed to find somewhere else to go to school because it was a waste of time me being there. And I can remember my mum and dad just being, just being so cross because they knew that I was perfectly bright. I just wasn't very good at exams and wasn't very good at school. I've got an older brother who is very dyslexic. Um, and he's also super successful. He started Virgin Mobile with Richard Branson, which is how I met Richard. But my mum and dad said, look, okay, we're just going to take Kate out and send her to the same school that, that my brother was at. So I then literally, my life was transformed overnight from feeling that I was stupid, from having terrible anxiety about, about school and life and everything that comes with, with a, a really bad experience at school. I was sent to a school that just transformed my life. And I can remember going into the, to meeting the headmaster because it, uh, it was a school that is a mainstream school, but entry was on interview. They didn't care about your exams. It was about whether they thought you had something to offer and were the right fit. And I remember saying to the headmaster, look, I'm, I'm not very good at exams. I'm not very smart. I'm not going to be able to pass any of the tests that you give me. But I really like the school and I really wanted to come because it was just incredible. And he said to me, well, we don't care about exams. He said, we can teach you to read. We can teach you all the things that you need to learn. And we can even get you to pass the exams that you need to pass. He said, that's not what it's about. It's about what's your passion? What are you good at? What do you really love to do? And he said, because that's what will make you successful in life. And that's really what my education was from there on in. It was, it was looking at different ways of thinking and different skills and different talents and then getting the, the support. 
So that that was life changing for me. And when I had my first son, it was really clear to me that he was dyslexic because he would, at age three, he knew the name of every single dinosaur. Um, he could tell you where they were a herbivore or a carnivore. Uh, he could tell you everything about them, but he could barely write his name. He had no interest in reading and he was super creative, loved music, really artistic. So I went into the school and sort of said, look, I know he's dyslexic. I'm pretty sure he's dyslexic. It runs really strong in my family. So can you just keep an eye on it and make sure that you test him when it's necessary? And they, they said, oh yeah. And of course we know all about dyslexia. Don't worry about it. We'll sort of see what happens. Um, but Ted, Ted went from being a really brilliant, creative, wonderful, outgoing little child, um, to coming home from school one day. And I was reading him a story and this will make me cry. So I apologize in advance, but I was reading him a story, his bedtime story. And he said to me, mommy, what can I do to not wake up in the morning? Sorry. Cause he said, he said, I hate school and I just don't want to go into school. I just want to stay asleep, which is just as a parent. That's just the worst thing you can ever hear a child say. So I went back into the school the following morning and said, look, Ted is dyslexic. I know he's dyslexic. Will you test him? And they did test him eventually after I put up. I mean, they, we were being told that he's just not very bright. He's a little bit disruptive. He's a naughty kid. All the things you get labeled at. And then as soon as he was identified, he got the support he needed. And um, he, he, he started to do better. We didn't stay at that school. Actually, we moved and sent him to um, my old school. And um, yeah, but that's where my journey started. I then I trained in dyslexia. Uh, and that's really where my mission began because we could afford to take Ted out to send him to a school he wanted to go to. And most people can't. And it is, you know, it's still a case no. that 80% of dyslexic kids are leaving school unidentified. So it's just so important that we change this, this stigma and make sure kids are picked up. You know, Ted is flourishing. He's his love back when he was five years old was music and performing. And he now, um, he writes, he's an art recording artist and he's got a huge successful career writing stuff for music and films. So he's living his dream and his passion. And my other younger son, who's also dyslexic, we didn't pick up his dyslexia till he was a little bit older. Um, cause he kind of was at a good school that did the font, got phonics and he got reading and everything, but it's his, difficulty is sort of processing speeds. Um, but with extra time, he is now, he passed all his exams. He was actually an A-grade student um, and he's a copywriter. So he's doing what he loves. He loves words, loves doing all of that stuff. So they've both lent into their strengths. And I think my my mission really is just to help everybody to understand that they are brilliant and they just need to really lean into that and, and not feel the stigma that we all feel. And kids should never, no child should be made to feel like my child felt. That's just wrong. No, it is wrong. And I think, like, thank you so much for sharing that. Because I know that, I mean, I feel emotional listening to it. Because I'm just thinking, you know, like, I went through school, coming home to my mum, saying how much I hated school. But I loved the social side. It was like a really confusing time. I loved seeing my friends. And I think one of my skills is communication. Yeah. You know, that's something that I've figured out through my journey. But it was completely shrouded in fear of talking out or communicating because I felt exactly how Ted felt. And I just think what an incredible mother you are to actually see that and understand it and take Thank him out you. because sadly so many people just don't have the awareness of it. And you've literally taken that and you're like, I'm going to create charity that everyone around the world will understand that this is not an issue, that this is actually something that can be a real superpower. And, you know, I feel really emotional listening to that story because it just takes me back to kind of all of my schooling days. And as you said, 80% of people leave undiagnosed. And that was very much me. And many people, yet 10% of people are dyslexic. It's actually one in five people. It's one in five. The, yeah, one the in UK five. uses one in 10, but it is one in five people. The US stat is one in five. And we've done research in schools where we've we've looked at the percentage and, and it is, it's more than one in 10. But even the one in 10 aren't being picked up. So, But imagine how good that is for the world if we know that we've got these people with exactly the thinking the future needs, exactly the thinking that will work alongside artificial intelligence. We should be excited as a world. We need to find these people and celebrate them and let them be the, the amazing thinkers that they can be. 
not um, constantly tell them that they're not good enough because they don't fit into the sort of standardised way we measure intelligence. Completely. And I think that that is one of the most detrimental things that anyone can hear is that they're not good enough because it completely shrouds your confidence. And I've seen it how it shrouded my confidence. And I feel very lucky that I've kind of managed to have many conversations around this to kind of bring my confidence back up. But I think you mentioned something there that I'm only starting to understand now is that there's different types of dyslexia because a lot of people just go, oh, well, you know, you can't write or you can't spell or you can't do your phonics or you're slow. And I've realized that I'm parts of different things, but I don't kind of cover all of the spectrum of dyslexia. Like I am extremely dyslexic. I was told I was in the 1% severity, but you know, I had a high IQ. So I felt very lucky that I actually managed to process things well, but there was just certain things that I really, really struggled with. And I think so many people have different types of dyslexia. You you mentioned emotions there. Like there's so many different areas of dyslexia, but I think it becomes very stigmatized into reading and writing. Can you explain a little bit about like the different types that people might experience? Because you said there so well, and your two sons are dyslexic but they're so different in their abilities and in their strengths and their weaknesses. Almost my entire family are dyslexic. I think my mum is the only one that wasn't, but um, my dad, my aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, both my kids, my husband's dyslexic, and we're all different. We all have, you know, similar traits, but a different pattern of those traits. So I think if you if you think of dyslexia as a spiky profile, and you'll have some things that you're really good at, and you will literally be in the top 1% good at those things. And then you'll have other things that you're really bad at, and you're often very low on on those as well. So sometimes, I mean, Ted was in the bottom 1% for a couple of things. I can't remember what they are off the top of my head now. I was maths. Yes, well, <laughs> sequential memory, um, which is maths. That was my bad thing as well. And Ted's actually. It's a spiky profile and you just have different spikes and different troughs. So, um, you know, Will, for instance, my younger son, um, had really good phonics at school. He had really good teaching at school. So he kind of got through to he was about, till he was about eight or nine. And then at eight or nine, the workload goes up dramatically. And he just couldn't keep up with having to get all of his thoughts on paper in time. If Will was at school now, technology would have completely transformed that for him. It was obviously around, but it wasn't as readily available to use. It's about Understanding your challenges and making sure that you either use technology or are open that these are the things you're not very good at and delegate. Um, and then really leaning into your strengths as well. So it's understanding your, your profile, your dyslexia. We have a great thing on the website, which is the, um, your dyslexic thinking passport, which is we've got for kids and we've got for adults as well. So you can actually say, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm bad at. This is what I need. And this is what I really don't want you to say about me, which which is very important, particularly for kids. I mean, Will, even though he was at a good school, was constantly told, you're so slow, hurry up, hurry up. I mean, how can you say that to a dyslexic child who's sitting there really trying hard to do their work, but just can't get their thoughts on paper quick enough? It, you know, it should really have been... Mm record your thoughts into your iPhone or use technology or um, just bullet point and finish off later. Um, There's so many things you can do. And also just going back onto the point about schools, there are some brilliant schools that are doing dyslexia brilliantly. It doesn't cost money to do it brilliantly. Mm. It's all about knowledge and it's all about understanding dyslexic strengths, dyslexic challenges and putting in the support to, to nurture both. And that's our message really for educators is just look at what you can do because it's so easy and it's what's dyslexic kid is good for dyslexic kids is good for all kids because we all all have different strengths and challenges it's about looking at that child as a whole and and supporting what their passions are and, and what their strengths are I think what's really interesting that comes out of this you know that point that you made is that we all have strengths and weaknesses. I mean, obviously dyslexics are much more pinpointed when they're younger because they are very aware of all their weaknesses and they grow up basically listening to those weaknesses and and never really seeing those strengths. But I think all of us in society, whether we're neurodivergent or not neurodivergent, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And we normally tend to listen to our weaknesses more than our strengths. And as you said, if one poor comment is made, you said four more positive comments need to kind of happen to balance that act out. And how 
bad is that for our self-esteem? That actually all we're doing is listening to those weaknesses. And I think that's why it's so important to talk about this conversation, whether you're neurodivergent or not, is actually like what I've realized is I can just hire someone for my weaknesses or I can, there's, a, there's a tool I can use for that, which is really, really helpful. Whereas before I would kind of like go through life thinking, well, like these, all of these opportunities are not there for me because I can't do all of them really well. Where actually like you don't need to do all of them really well. And I think if someone had told me that when I was younger, <laughs> then actually that would have really inspired me to go and do those things because I know that there's other people that can or have those strengths and they don't have my strengths. And basically, you know, when looking at co like co-partners or co-founders together, that's what's really important is looking at like, what's your strengths and what's your strengths? And actually, if they're opposite, then they're going to work really well in making a successful business. Exactly. And, you know, the most powerful or the most successful teams um, or successful businesses rely on having teams that work to their strengths. And, you know, everybody is beginning to realize that now. So you, you, you'll have dyslexic people are going to be brilliant at something. You are, like you say, you'll have somebody who isn't dyslexic who will be really good at others. It's about understanding your superpower and making sure that's what you spend your time doing. And your kryptonite is the thing that you delegate to, to somebody else, which for a dyslexic person is absolutely essential, but it's actually good for everybody because we all love doing the things we're passionate um, and good at and don't like doing the things that we're not so good at. There'll be somebody else out there and it's that'll be their superpower. So let them do it. But I think that's, you know, what, what is good for dyslexics is good for everybody. And I think that's what a lot of um, organisations and, and schools are now beginning to realise. We are speaking about this in a a beautiful way by understanding strengths and weaknesses. But I think some people might be like, well, I don't know what my strength is. You know, like they're talking about all of these strengths, but what is my strength? What is my advantage? Is there any advice or strategies or anything that you kind of felt that you went through where you started to really realize what your strength was and how you could lean more into that? Because I think that's really encouraging for anyone to learn or be aware of to basically understand what that is. Because I think sometimes if we're battered in confidence, we actually just don't feel that we're good at anything. I am so happy that we've teamed up with Bloomin for this season of the podcast to claim your free month of natural mushroom-based supplements. Head to bloomin.co.uk and use the code LWBW1000 to try it for free. There is a link in the show notes. So a few things. Firstly, on our website, we've got a dyslexic thinking test, which is it's free. It's a checklist test, but it, it'll help you to. Well, firstly, it'll tell you if you're dyslexic, if you think you might be, but haven't been properly identified. But also it looks at all the strengths. So it'll help you to think about the things that you're good at. Um, and it and it kind of it, it will help to kind of measure those or rate those as well. It's interesting because before I started Made by Dyslexia, I did we did masses of research into dyslexic thinking skills to come up with the framework to kind of identify what dyslexic thinking was and work with some really smart psychometricians and um, workplace psychologists and things to kind of come and spoke to thousands of dyslexic people um, to kind of create the framework. But I also did a lot of research into success and, and became a sort of a success book junkie. So I kind of really understood, you know, how come so many dyslexic people become very successful? What is it that they do? And is there a pattern that um, is there for all people? And there is. It's about doing what you love. It's about understanding what are you passionate about? What are you naturally good at? What do you love to do? And do as much of that as you possibly can. And um, it is, that's definitely the, the sort of success secret for dyslexic people, but it is for all people. And I think in terms of finding what those things are, I think if you, it, you know, I'm not a great artist or a great musician or all the sort of creative things that, that you, you think are often attribute to dyslexia. And yes, that's true. I mean, half the Beatles were dyslexic and half the world's greatest artists were as well. But actually, my skill, um, or, or some of my dyslexic thinking skills, I, I've got amazing emotional intelligence. I can understand people. I do empathize with people and I get, I cry at everything. I, I really, I'm like I'm an emotional sponge. I really get 
people and things and feel very deeply about them. And that's that's definitely an advantage for me when I'm trying to problem solve or come up with ideas or or or, or empathize with with a lot of our community. Um, I'm also very good at simplifying things because I don't like lots of information. I find it and social media sometimes where it's bombarding you with loads of different sorts just doesn't mm. my head in. But if you keep things really simple and everything, every single complex problem does boil down to something really simple. And I'm very, very good at doing that as well. Um, and I've always done that as a child. I was always asking questions. So why does it have to be that way? If you did it this way, it would actually make a lot more sense. So it's like that sort of logical thinking of simplifying things. So uh, my people skills were there when I was a kid. I always empathized with people. So were my, you know, that skill of being able to simplify um, and then also communicating, be able to story tell things so people understand it. All of those things were there when I was a child, naturally. And I think they are in most people. So it's not, you know, Ted happened to be really good at, at music and, and performing. And that is what he's ended up doing. He also has great emotional intelligence, which um, has carried him through when he's songwriting or, or doing the stuff that he does. But I do just one thing I would say that I think one of the downsides about being having high emotional intelligence is that you also can sense when people think you're stupid or sometimes you imagine that people are thinking things about you they're not. So it's kind of keeping that in check, which is about keeping your confidence and your resilience. So if you want to find what your strengths are, what do you love to do? What do you, you know? It might, how do you how do you interact with your family? What is it? Where is your role within your family? It's really easy to to recognise that all of those things, or if you recognise that all of those things are strengths, um, then it's easy to find them. When you do end up finding that, you find out your purpose a lot more because you find out that you're getting up to enjoy something you do every day, and that relates very much to. I don't know if you've heard about it, the icky guy, but to caveat that, I related so much to the emotional intelligence part where you feel other people and you do feel that energy when you walk in and you know that somebody is looking at you in a different way. And I remember when I first had one of my board meetings when I was like 28 and I had to sit down and kind of like stand up and speak in front of people. And all I could feel was everyone's energy. And all I could think was, they don't think I know what I'm talking about. I'm too young to be here. What am I doing? This is ridiculous. Like, get out. Like, stop talking. And I basically just became mute because I was just so terrified of the judgment that I was going to have. And I think those things are really important to keep in check and making sure that you are speaking to yourself in a really positive light and actually not taking that home with you. Because I think for a really long time, I did leave with those emotions as opposed to actually not letting them affect you, which is easier said than done. But it's something that I think all of us can kind of carry with us on how people represent us and how we're misinterpreted. I think that's something that is really important just to kind of highlight on what you said. Yeah, I think so. And I'm sure those people weren't thinking that about you. And and maybe if no, even if some of them were, I'm sure that. you soon changed their minds. But it is that thing of, it. well, it's like any skill, isn't it? You have to hone it. And if your skill is mm -hmm. emotional intelligence and reading the room and, and feeling people's vibes, then you just have to say, okay, when do you, when do you actually put your barrier up to say, this is, I'm here to do a job. This is what I want to say. And it doesn't matter what everybody else is, is thinking. It is about sort of honing it and knowing when to turn it up, switch it on and switch it off. Yeah. And it's definitely, you know, part amalgamated with your own mm. lack of self-esteem. I think that's like a huge thing um, to be aware of. And so like, I really want to come on now, Kate, to a bonus question, which is part of our Apple subscribers. And I've really tried not to pick up on it very much in the conversation because I was keeping this to the very end because it's something that I am totally fascinated by, but also it has helped me more so than ever in the last year, and that is AI. And I was a little bit scared to talk about it, first of all, because you kind of are worried to talk about AI in, in an open format. But when I read something on Made by Dyslexia that you did with Richard Branson, where you kind of spoke about actually the positives in the future that I, AI can bring, I really want to break this down into two different questions. And so the first question I want to start about AI is how can AI help dyslexics, first of all? You know, how is it really helpful for dyslexic minds? And if you want to listen to that, head to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to Live Well, Be Well now. Kate, I have a final question for you. Just thinking, if the definition of dyslexia was to be changed, what should it be changed to? 
we have changed the dictionary definition of dyslexia um, or of dyslexic thinking. When we added dyslexic thinking to, as a skill to LinkedIn, um, we also got dictionary.com uh, to add dyslexic thinking as a noun. So I've got it here. So tell me if this is correct, because this is what Google's telling me. Dyslexic thinking as an approach to problem solving, assessing information and learning often used by people with dyslexia that involves pattern recognition. Spatical? 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 Spatial. See? There we go. There's my, there's my following. <laughs> Spatial reasoning, <laughs> lateral thinking, and interpersonal communication. I mean, it wouldn't be authentic if I didn't No, get it wouldn't. Wrong You've that, got would it. it. You have to get it wrong and be <laughs> proud of it. Four years ago, I would have cut that out and asked to do it again, but I'm not. Good. I'm going to keep that in and show that that is what dyslexia is doesn't mean it's a bit of disadvantage. I love that. I thought that, and you're already four steps ahead. You've already done it. Um, and that is just super inspiring to know that now any child's going through or anyone looking into the dictionary, actually, it seems like that's so positive. And it says all of the skills there that dyslexics have, as opposed to the negative things, which, you know, I very much grew up listening to and learning. So, um, Kate, on behalf of myself and every dyslexic, thank you so much for the work that you are doing um, to try and rewrite, you know, the definition of dyslexia and the thinking and the stigma attached to it. Because I think if we can actually work at this together in a really positive light, so many people coming up and so many kids changing through the schooling system will feel so much more supported and actually hopefully go on to create more technologies, more innovations, and, um, you know, many more successful entrepreneurs. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. And um, if people want to find out more about Made in Dyslexia, could you please direct them to the resources that you have available um, and obviously your fantastic podcast that you just recently launched, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the uh, uh, website is madebydyslexia.org. There's uh, lots of information on there. There's links to our teacher training videos, which are also brilliant for parents. There's a link to our workplace page, which will tell you um, about the training we've got coming up with LinkedIn. And our podcast is called Lessons in Dyslexic Thinking. And we've interviewed some of the world's most successful dyslexics who tell you how they think and how it's made them successful. Really inspiring conversations. So check that out too. And thank you so much for having me. It's been great to chat to you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so thank much. You. I've got a quick question for you before you go. Are you ready to reset your health? If you've been listening to my podcast or watching my YouTube channel for a while, you'll know that I believe everyone's well-being journey is totally unique and it needs to be tailored to you. But sometimes with all that important information out there, it's tough to know what to listen to, what to ignore or to prioritise how to make the best decision for you. It means taking that first step just gets put off, delayed or even ignored. But I'm here to help and I am so excited to offer you my 30 day mini course to help revitalize, restore and totally reset your health so you can discover the happiest of you. Your journey might include harnessing your breath work and mindfulness game, changing up your diet for healthier meals, or simply improving your daily habits to be healthier and happier. Whatever your decision, my course is the perfect jumpstart you need, and you'll get access to the course for a one-off payment for just $14.99. Just click the link in the description or visit my website and I'll see you there. And by the way, I've got tons of videos for you in this channel and YouTube thinks that you'll like this one the most. So why don't you click on it now and give it a try. Thanks for listening.